Hello and welcome to this NASA Goddard Google Plus Hangout on Earthrise, one of the most iconic photographs ever taken by humans. Now thanks to new data acquired by a NASA satellite that is orbiting the moon right now, NASA visualizers have been able to recreate the experience of the Apollo 8 astronauts as they scramble to take these photographs in both black and white and in color. This new visualization essentially lets you sit on the shoulders of these three astronauts in their small space capsule or while they orbited the moon and experienced this moment of Earthrise. I'm Aries Keck here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland and during this hangout we'll be talk taking your questions and talking about this moment in history, how the visualization was made and the other scientific discoveries being made by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. To ask a question just put it in the comment section of this hangout or in the comment section of YouTube or on Twitter we'll be moderating the hashtag Earthrise, it's all one word. Um, joining us for this hangout is the project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is also known, known as LRO, and that's John Keller. Seated in front of NASA Goddard's hyperwall is science visualizer Ernie Wright. And joining us from his home in Vermont is space historian Andrew Chaikin. Andrew is the author of the book A Man on the Moon, which formed the basis for the 12 part HBO series about NASA's Apollo project. It was called From the Earth to the Moon. And Andrew, we're going to go to you first. Can you set the stage here for this moment in history that we're going to watch a little bit in this hangout? Well, sure. Hi, Aries. Thank you. Um, you know, this is one of the most incredible moments in the history of exploration. Um, Apollo was the program that landed humans on the moon, and we rightfully focus on the moon landing as the big triumphant moment for Apollo, but really, in a human sense, it was Apollo 8 that really kind of was a climax, because it was the first time humans left their home planet and journeyed to another world, when Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders fired their uh, booster to go out of Earth orbit and then make a, a journey of about 230,000 miles to go into orbit around the moon. And, you know, the I wrote about this extensively and I talked to the astronauts and I thought there I thought I knew everything that there was to know about Apollo 8 and particularly about the moment that we call Earthrise but what's amazing is how this new uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter data has allowed Ernie Wright and his colleagues at Goddard to go back and literally perform detective work and uncover new details and I'll just give you a brief sense of what is so amazing about this. Um, you know, the moment of the Earth rise, you can only see an Earth rise from orbit around the moon. What happens is, and I have my visual aids here, you actually are going over the moon uh -huh. and your orbital motion carries you around the moon and as you come around from the far side of the moon to the near side, the side that always faces the Earth, the Earth actually comes up above the horizon and actually pops up. What I'd always thought, and most of us had always thought, was that the spacecraft was coming around the moon like so, with its nose roughly pointed at the Earth, or maybe slightly to the side, or something like that. What Ernie was able to figure out from the onboard photography, because there was a, another camera that was pointed, sort of bore-sided with the nose of the spacecraft, like a gun camera on a, a World War II fighter, that kind of thing. Anyway, those photographs reveal that the spacecraft was actually pointed at the moon and was actually rotating such that as the astronauts came around from the moon for the fourth time, the spacecraft rotated so that Bill Anders in the right-hand seat could see the Earth coming up. Now, this was something that had happened three times before on Apollo 8, but because the windows were pointed away from the Earth as they came around, they didn't see it. And now, as you see in the video, the new video, which is beautiful recreations of the event using the LRO data, but it's also synchronized with the onboard voice tape. And it's a, it's a fantastic human moment of exploration. You can hear the, the amazement in Bill's voice as he sees the Earth coming up, and then Jim Lovell comes up and sees it too. And there ensues a scramble for color film and finally, um, Anders is able to capture the photo. He took one black and white right away, and then he's able to capture the color shot that became an icon of the 20th century. 
And I know we're working on getting some of that video up in a minute now. I wonder, Andrew, as the historian here, I breezed over the three astronauts, but who exactly were these men? How many times had they been up? Right. Well, Apollo 8 was truly the, the moment at which NASA um, really could, could uh, take a giant leap, uh, maybe not to the surface of the moon, but away from the Earth to orbit the moon. And to command that mission, um, they, got, they gave that mission to Frank Borman, who had been the commander of Gemini 7, which was a mission in December of 1965, in which he and Jim Lovell spent two weeks orbiting the Earth in a very tiny, very cramped Gemini cockpit uh, to show that humans could survive in space long enough to make a lunar voyage. Um, Jim Lovell, who was his crewmate on that flight, Gemini 7, was also with him on Apollo 8 as the flight's navigator. And the third crewman, Bill Anders, was a rookie um, who was making his first and, as it turned out, only space flight. And his uh, function on the mission was to be the systems engineer, keep track of the systems, also did a lot of the photographic work and a lot of the uh, business of observing the moon through the spacecraft windows from lunar orbit. So it was a and for me, as a storyteller of space, as a historian, what I love about the Apollo 8 story is that there's such different personalities. Frank Borman is sort of the gruff, no-nonsense, military-style commander. Uh, Anders is the rookie, um, a little more, a little, little more serious-minded. Um, and Lovell really has a kind of a, a great spirit that comes through in his comments about the Earth as a grand oasis from space. He designed the mission patch, um, which was a beautiful figure eight going around the moon and the Earth. So you have these three very different personalities in this spacecraft experiencing one of the most unbelievable moments in the history of exploration. And now, Ernie, you were the visualizer taking some of this data from a current mission, LRO, and recreating this moment. What inspired you to try to recreate this moment? Um, we, you know, we already had the audio and we already had the still pictures. Why put the time into taking true scientific data of the moon and recreating something that happened so long ago? Well, there were a couple of reasons for that. I mean, it started when my wife got me a poster of the Earthrise image for Christmas a couple of years ago. And it was for my office. And so as I sort of unfurled it in my office and looked at it, I said, you know, I've got a ton of great LRO data that maybe I could use to recreate this. Um, and so last year for Earth Day, we released a very simple sort of recreation that matched the photographs with LRO terrain, and I was happy with that one. But as I did the write-up for it, I realized that there was a lot that we didn't know about the circumstances surrounding that photo. Um, so I sort of filed that away. And about a year later, um, I started to look at some of the other Apollo 8 photography. And I realized, as, as Andy mentioned, there was a camera that was pointed straight down at the lunar surface. And it was taking pictures every 20 seconds. And right around the time of the Earthrise photographs, you could see that the images that were taken by this camera were rotating. And so, it, I mean, it told me two things. It told me that the spacecraft was pointing straight down, and it also told me that it was rolling when the photos were taken. Um, so I carefully matched those photos to the terrain, determined which way the spacecraft was pointing, and, you know, that opened up um, the recognition that there were other things going on, like which window was the Earth visible in? Um, and these are things that we didn't know before. So by the end of it, um, we knew probably which window each photo was taken from and, and who took them. Um, and it, it, that was really possible because LRO has this amazing global um, data set that just didn't exist before. Um, we really didn't have uh, a global um, elevation map for the moon that was good enough to do this. Um, so that's what made it possible. It was this convergence of the data, which I work with all the time, and the idea of seeing if we could, you know, recreate Earthrise just as a way to, I mean, it's, 
it's in a funny way, it's a way to ground truth the data. You know, if you can match that to a photograph taken by somebody who is actually there, you know everything's good. And it made me very happy when all of that came together. That's fantastic. One of the things you you brought up, and part the reasons this made it possible was the the spacecraft that is currently right now orbiting our moon, um, LRO. I'm going to try to say it one more time: Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, LRO. John Keller, you're the project scientist for LRO. Can you tell us what that spacecraft is doing? What instruments are on that as it's orbiting the moon right now? Oh, and John, I think your microphone's muted. You got to unmute the microphone. Sure. Hey. Uh, LRO, LRO went into space in uh, June of 2009. It's a mission that's both an exploration mission and a science mission. There's seven instruments on there. Um, the two that uh, I should highlight are uh, the laser altimeter um, and the uh, camera system, because those are the two that were used by uh, uh, Ernie to uh, recreate the the, the uh, uh, the Earth rise, and uh, so so we have been you know with the with the laser it's an advanced laser that has uh, pinged the moon uh, 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 three billion shots over the time, um, and you just measure the time of flight for the laser to hit the surface and for it to come back, and that tells you uh, the surface uh, how hot you know the distance to this to the surface and you get the shape of the moon. Uh, prior to uh, LRO going into space, we actually knew the shape of Mars better than we do, do the moon. Did the moon, and now uh, we know the moon and the shape of the moon better than we know uh, any any planet, including Earth. And the Earth, because so much of the Earth is underwater, that we we, we don't know the topography that well. John, I uh, have a quick question for you on that. When you're shooting this laser down. To to the moon's surface from um, the orbiter. Is it affecting the moon's surface at all, or is it like those little uh, lasers we play with our cats where it's just a light? It's, uh, it's very, uh, it doesn't affect it at all because it's, uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's not a very strong laser. Second, it's, it's broken up into five different spots. So simultaneously, we hit the, the moon with five spots. And then third, the distance fr from which we were lasing from, uh, you know, on, most of most of it was 50 kilometers up, so the spot size is spread out quite a bit by the time it reaches the, the moon. And then the other uh, part is is the uh, camera, and what Ernie has to do is he takes the you know the the full moon is has been created has been photographed by LRO at at a uh, hundred meter resolution, and and he 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 lays down the images of the uh, uh, that were taken by the camera onto this topography, and by doing that, that's that's what you're seeing in his uh, in, in his video, and 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 really able to match what what the photographer uh, Bill Anders was seeing on uh, on the Apollo 8. Fantastic. I know we're going to pull up some of the uh, just a segment of this recreation that Ernie's created. The entire length of the the video that we put out today is a full six minutes long and it incorporates both some of the visualizations and some archival footage of the uh, Apollo astronauts themselves and you'll find that link on our, our Goddard uh, Google Plus page. We'll have it on the YouTube page shortly and it's out on NASA.gov as well. Um, one of the things, we're getting questions in. I wanted to remind everybody, we're taking your questions. If you go hashtag Earthrise, I'm following along here on, a, on an iPad, or put the questions in the YouTube section and comments or on Google Plus. And I have a question that um, comes from someone by the name of Tyler Waldrop at, uh, at, at Shadow404. And now we're holding this. Next week is the 45th anniversary of this event. Um, he, Tyler wants to know how old each of us was back when Apollo 8 was happening. I'm not going to answer that, though I have an easy out and that I wasn't even around then. But were you, was anybody, anybody else in the Hangout, were you? At an age where you remember this event or any of the Apollo program? Well, I'll uh, jump in and say that, uh, you know, for me, uh, I was, every Apollo mission, I was glued to the TV. I was 12 years old, and I had my little mission control in the den with my maps of the moon and my models of the spacecraft and copies of Time and Newsweek, and, you know, I was doing everything I could to, uh, you know, vicariously participate in the mission. So, yes, I remember it as one of the great 
moments of my growing up. Yeah, for me, uh, I I uh, I certainly remember the Apollo uh, eleven landing, and I know I was in fifth grade at the time. <laughs> I yeah, I was I was six years old, um, and remember. What I remember most clearly is 11 because my parents let me stay up late. Um, 11, 11 landed in the afternoon, but they did their first spacewalk at about 10.30 Eastern time, and that was way past my bedtime, but they, they let me stay up and watch it. And so that memory is imprinted. Um, but, you know, when you're six, you think you go to the moon every day, and so that part of it didn't make a big impression on me until I was much older, and, and I was... Grateful that I that I could see that as a as a you know it's in my living memory, but um, it took a little while for me to understand the significance of it. That's fantastic. We have another question as we get the video with the audio queued up. We're going to play a little bit of it so you'll be able to hear the astronauts as they they grab cameras and take this image and, and part of the gorgeous visualization that Ernie Wright put together. Please keep asking questions at hashtag Earthrise. I'm Mary Keck here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and we're talking about this amazing image and actually while, uh, while we also still have Ernie up, he's sitting in front of a hyperwall which is a whole bunch of big flat screen TVs that we use here for science visualizations and that's one of that's the image we're talking about. This image of the Earth actually rising, just like how the sun rises when we're here on Earth. The Earth rising over the horizon of the Moon. Um, one of the next questions we've got is at VR Doug, and what he wanted to know is what about this VR? What photo realistic? I think he's asking what makes this photo realistic. And I'm wondering, Ernie, that's a question for you. Was it in lining up? The, the sort of the original image and then taking the new LRO data with its really high quality uh, information and lining up to make it essentially a recreation? That's exactly right. Um, for every photograph that you see in the video, um, I was using animation software and positioned a virtual camera over a model of the terrain and I really did this by eye. You know, I moved the camera a little bit this way, that way, um, changed the changed the direction that it was pointing um, until I got an exact match with the photographs. Um, and that information tells you something about which way the spacecraft is turning too, because once you get the camera in the right place, you know that the real camera was in a certain position and pointed in a certain direction. Um, so the the visuals and the understanding of the geometry kind of um, created a feedback. Fantastic. And Andrew, um, wanted to ask you again real quick, When is it unusual for historians to use these types of animations or computer recreations to see things from a new angle or a different angle? Or is that becoming something that historians use quite a bit with different, for different aspects? Well, it certainly wasn't available 25 years ago when I was writing A Man on the Moon. I mean, I was, my, my recreation was in my mind uh, using the onboard voice tape, my delving through the transcripts of the communications, the post-flight debriefing, and of course my interviews with Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. What's so neat about being able to revisit this now with today's technology is that first of all, we've got images from LRO that are so good. I mean, if you go on the web and you Google LRO Apollo landing sites, you will see images that are so good that you can literally see the astronauts tracks that they made with their feet disturbing the lunar soil so that gives you some idea of how powerful the cameras are and then as, as John pointed out when combined with the really beautiful uh, laser altimetry data on the topography that nails down the three dimensionality of the moon and the last piece of the puzzle is this ability to do uh, computer-generated scenes that can be viewed from any realistic viewpoint and there are realistic computer models of the spacecraft we can use and as Ernie said you set up a virtual camera so is it unusual I think probably nowadays um, it's going to become more and more common but you know it's it's sort of the old maxim about um, computers in general, you're, you know, if your data is no good, 
as they used to say in the old days of computing, garbage in, garbage out. And what's so great about this is the data is so good that the historical conclusions that come out of that data, and it's been it's been interpreted so beautifully by Ernie and his his colleagues, the historical knowledge that comes out of that is so good that it matches up precisely with everything we knew before. You can, in fact, one little detail that I'll share, the tape, one of the things that Ernie noticed on the tape, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't notice this 25 years ago, but Ernie beat me to it, is that you can literally hear on the tape when Bill Anders clicks the shutter on the Hasselblad, you hear the shutter and then the motorized film advance as he takes each of these three photos, first the black and white and then the two color. And that allowed him to precisely place the audio with the recreated motion of the spacecraft and the visual of the moon. So it is a full, literally a full recreation of the event. And I'm just glad that technology has progressed to the point where we can do that. I mean, it would have made my life a lot easier 25 years ago, but uh, better <laughs> late than never. That's great. Well, the biggest comment we're getting now from everyone is play the animation already. So we're going to mute our microphones and we're going to share this, the, just a snippet of this longer video. You can see the full length video at the website. And let's all mute our mics and they're going to play some of this with the audio of the actual astronauts. The impact crater with uh, at uh, just part of the subsolar point on the south side and the floor of it, uh, and leaving because there is one dark hole. But I couldn't get a quick enough look at it. See if it might be anything volcanic. Oh my god, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Hey, don't take that off schedule. <laughs> Got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color. Oh man, that's cool. Hey. Where is it? Out here, just grab me a color. A color experience. There you go. Got one? Yeah, I'm looking for one. C368. There you go. Here. Honey. Right. Yeah, that's Yeah, I got it right here. Let me get up here. Not clear. No, I got it framed. It's very clear right here. Got it? Yep. Thank you, Pebble. Nice right travel up here. Hey, let me just get the right setting here. Okay, calm down, Pebble. Oh, well, I got it. Right here. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. 250 at F11. Well, very, very explosion. I did. I just drew up. You sure you got it now? Yeah, we'll get ready. It'll come up again. Yeah, That was fantastic. I love hearing them argue a little bit of like, I got it, I got it, we're fine, I got it. Um, and uh, Andrew Chaikin, remind us again just who were the three gentlemen we just heard talking and that was the audio, the original audio with Ernie Wright's brilliant recreation of that moment as we mm. were out in space looking at the Apollo capsule. Who are those three guys we just heard talk? Right, so 
So the first voice you hear is Frank Borman, the mission commander who's over in the left seat, uh, left-hand side of the spacecraft, and he announces that they're about to perform a roll maneuver, which is in the flight plan. The reason he's doing it is because he wants to rotate the spacecraft so that Jim Lovell, the navigator, who's down in the lower equipment bay, can use the onboard sextant to sight on lunar landmarks. Anders, meanwhile, is in the right seat. He's looking out his window at the moon and making observations into the tape recorder for the benefit of the scientists back on Earth when they hear those tapes. When the Earth comes up, as the, as the spacecraft rotates and Anders suddenly sees it coming out his side window, he says, oh my god, look at that picture over there. And Borman jokes with him and says, don't take that, it's not scheduled. And the reason Borman says that is because earlier in the day, while they had, pretty shortly after they had fired their engine to go into lunar orbit, they were looking down at the moon and they were amazed and Frank Borman wanted to take a picture and he asked Bill Anders for the camera and Bill was the keeper of the photo plan and Bill got very kind of intense about it and you can hear on the onboard voice tapes Frank says I just want to take a picture I mean he's just like tourists everywhere so when it comes to this moment of the earth rise it's Anders who has the camera and Borman who's flying the spacecraft just kind of gives him a little jab there about hey don't take that it's not scheduled and indeed it wasn't scheduled because this was a a complete surprise. Then you hear Lovell come up from the lower equipment bay to join Anders at the window. You hear him say, oh man, that's great. Anders, meanwhile, who has already taken the black and white, is now intensely focused on getting a color magazine so he can slap that on. It takes Lovell a few minutes, a few, several long moments, to find it. By that time, the Earth has disappeared from the side window because spacecraft still turning but now it's in view in the rendezvous window which is right in front of Anders and also the center hatch window which is actually kind of cloudy it actually is kind of surprising that Lovell said I've got it right here it's very clear because really that window was pretty well clouded up but Anders has the telephoto lens and he aims it through the rendezvous window and takes the color pictures and then at the very end one last little touch and this was something that Bill, I played the tape sitting next to Bill Anders in his office in 1987. And uh, you hear Lovell say, are you sure you got it now? And Anders kind of dryly says, yeah, I, I think it'll come up again. And that, that leads us beautifully to a question we have coming in. Um, and please bring your questions in as we go through and take out this tape. The entire long visualization is available on the internet at that URL behind me. Um, John Heasley uh, wants to know, was the crew of Apollo 8 able to see the Earthrise on later orbits? And how about other missions? Andrew? Yes. And in fact, um, this was a bit of research that I had done before Ernie and I got hooked up. Uh, this was several years ago. I, I just took the, there were later Earthrise photos taken with a wider lens, an 80 millimeter lens. And um, for example, if you've ever seen you collectors out there, the Look Magazine special issue on Apollo 8, you see a very wide view of the horizon, a very small Earth peeking up above it. Those photographs were taken, I think, Ernie, on what, the sixth and seventh uh, orbits of the moon, whereas the ones we're looking at here were the fourth orbit, so several hours later, and we know that Bill had the 250 millimeter telephoto lens when these these ones that we're looking at now were taken. The fact that it was the wide lens suggests that it was probably Borman. In fact, you can see uh, the outline of Borman's rendezvous window, I think. Isn't that right, Ernie? I Yeah, it was actually orbits five and seven. And because I was able to find the, the cloud map, the cloud pattern for the Earth, and match that, uh, it's very easy to match up you know, the times that uh, those photographs were taken. I think it's even the case that on Orbit 7, the transcript has Frank saying, um, you know, guess what just came up again? And he's talking to Jim, and he says, you know, and Jim says something else, and he says, no, it was the Earth. And, and so I'm fairly confident that Frank took, you know, about 12 of those pictures with the shorter lens. Right. Um, but we can, we've matched those, I've matched them up uh, as still images as well. And maybe at some point we'll put those out too. 
um, but it was definitely Orbit 5 and Orbit 7 that those. And I have that Look magazine uh, issue, by the way. And um, there were Earthrise pictures taken on the later missions. Every crew that yeah. went to the moon talked about the Earth as... It, it, Stu Ruza from Apollo 14 told me the Earth was the magnet of the flight. And that was the way they all felt, that yes, it was amazing to look down at the moon, but seeing the Earth from that distance was truly the, the high point. Thank you all so much. Please continue bringing in your great questions on Twitter at hashtag Earthrise or in the Google Plus Hangout. Um, several people have been asking um, whether the um, LRO spacecraft, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the one that's orbiting the moon right now, is taking Earthrise images. And that seems like a perfect question to John to talk about sort of the point of LRO and if it's getting any Earthrise images or not. John? Um, it turns out that the way the... Um the high resolution camera on, on LRO works, um, we, we, it's very difficult for us to, to, to recreate an Earthrise. Although we have looked back at the, at the Earth um, in the past and taken images of, of the Earth. And, and uh, one example is where we did a, um, a, a, a solar eclipse where we, could, we, could, we actually imaged the shadow of the moon uh, on the Earth. Um, but mostly uh, LRO is, is concentrating on its, its science objectives. As I mentioned earlier, it has seven instruments. Um, just very quickly, uh, there's a radiation detector on there that has a, a tissue equivalent plastic, and, and we study the radiation environment at the moon. There's a, a lunar radiometer where we measure the temperature of the lunar surface and it measure the coldest point. Uh, uh, measured in the solar system, and that is in, in these uh, areas at the poles, the permanently shadowed craters of the poles. Uh, we have an imaging UV spectrometer that's uh, concentrated on looking for water in, in some of these permanently shadowed craters and also looking at the atmosphere or the exosphere of the moon. It doesn't really have an atmosphere. There's a neutron detector that was contributed by the Russian Space Agency. Um, the altimeter, which I, we talked about, and the, uh, the cameras. There are really two camera systems. Uh, one is, uh, is the wide-angle camera, which is what Ernie used to recreate these. And then there's a narrow-angle camera, uh, which had from 50 kilometers up uh, 50 centimeter uh, resolution. And those are the ones that, uh, that was the camera system that we used for the, uh, the Apollo landing site uh, images. Um, and then finally, uh, we have uh, Mini-RF, which is a, uh, a radar system. So we're, we're able to, to make measurements of the lunar surface using, using radar. And now, John, I have a question you probably get all the time, which is, you know, are you doing all of this studying of the moon so we can ultimately live there or build a moon base there? Is it pure scientific discovery? When, what's the, the point of gathering all this data, aside from the fact that the moon is just beautiful? Well, um, it, you know, LRO started its life off as an exploration mission, and so we were uh, interested in, 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 in scouting landing, uh, potential landing sites for robotic missions as well as human landers. Really, LRO is creating the maps that will be used for generations uh, for any number of purposes. It's just uh, depending on how uh, uh, the space agencies of the world want to, want to use that, that, that data. Uh, but then also, you know, the moon is a, is a, is a witness to the history of the solar system. Uh, we're very interested in, for example, the cratering on the, on the moon. Uh, we, we study those craters carefully in order to understand um, um, uh, the, crater, uh, the asteroids' impacts on, on the moon throughout, throughout solar system history. Because the moon is right next to the Earth, by studying that, we know what was going. We can say something about what was happening uh, on the on the Earth in those early times. Whereas on the Earth, because of the Earth's atmosphere and plate tectonics, most of that information has been wiped out. So the, the Moon is our touchstone for understanding uh, the early history of the, the solar system. 
Thank you so much. And just a reminder, that was, that's John Keller. He's the project scientist for the LRO mission. Joining us also is Andrew Chaikin. He's a space historian. And Ernie Wright, who's a NASA Goddard uh, visualizer. And I'm Aries Keck here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And we're talking about Earthrise, the iconic image that you can see right now behind Ernie. Um, and that was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts. And also this beautiful recreation that we've done using LRO data. Um, I have a question that, that probably leans more for Ernie. Um, and uh, Ernie, people are asking a little bit about how to get your job. You sit there and make awesome computer <laughs> animation, real data. Um, two questions for you. One, it, could you talk a little bit about what you do and how this is different from um, what Pixar does? You know, you use true scientific data. And a, another question that falls into this, a lot of people are asking, apparently, the new Gran Turismo video game has a moon track where you race cars on the moon. Did you know about that? Were you involved with sending them any of this data so they could build a, a, a racetrack on the moon in that video game? I was not directly involved in that, um, but I can tell you that the all of the uh, data from LRO is being archived publicly. Um, it's in the planetary data system, and I think if you just search for LRO PDS, um, you'll find that all of the terrain data and the the albedo maps and a lot of the other data is out there. And um, so anybody who wants to do this can. Um, I have had inquiries from uh, movie makers over the past couple of years who, because we talk, uh, happen to know that I'm working on moon stuff. And they've asked me where this data is. And I just send them a link to the PDS. Um, so I didn't know about that particular game. Um, but I know that uh, imagery of the moon is getting better all the time, and it's because we have all this great LRO data, and it's all publicly available. Um, it, as far as what the studio does and how it's different from other animation studios, um, we use a lot of the same software. We use uh, Pixar's renderer, um, and for this one, I also used a little bit of uh, Lightwave. Um, but what makes it different is that everything we do is driven by data. Um, so we're not allowed to make anything up. Um, we get, we get uh, short-tempered with people who come and ask us to make things up because we don't know how. Um, our skills are really for um, taking data from scientific missions and showing them to other scientists and to the public um, in, in ways that sort of illuminate what that data means. Um, and we have uh, a website with several thousand of those animations that you can go to, and it's if you search for SVS, you'll find it. Um, if you want my job, um, most of the people that work in our studio have uh, computer science backgrounds. We also have uh, someone with a Master of Fine Arts, and we have an astrophysicist. Um, and so you bring your programming skills and your interest in space science um, and some experience with animation and uh, we'll look at your resume. Um, the, although I, I, I'd like for it not to be my job, I'd like for it to be a, another opening. Um, but it's, a, it's an odd skill set. I mean, it's, not, it, it's not a set of skills that everybody has. Um, so we're a, we're a very tight-knit group and we do a lot of custom programming that's the reason for the computer science background. Um, we need to, almost every time, write programs that translate scientific data into forms that can be used in animation software. Um, and we also have to apply a little bit of judgment about what a valid visual representation of this data is. Because um, it's pretty easy to misrepresent data if you just start goofing around with it and paste it wherever you like. Um, so those are kind of the things that we do on a daily basis. Fantastic. I'm going to try to go through some questions uh, real quick. Thank you all for sending them all in. Um, at Erie O'Donna wanted to know if Earth was the only planet that they were able to see from the moon. Um, Ernie, you're not. I don't know if you want to take that. I know Andrew probably also knows the, knows the answer. Um, but were, were, did the Apollo astronauts try to see other planets while they were up there in their orbiter? Uh, well... Yeah, go ahead, Ernie. All right. Um, the thing I will say about that is that um, it probably surprises people not to see stars in a lot of these um, images from Apollo. And uh, that's because most of the time they were in daylight. 
Um, and the astronauts themselves said that they didn't see um, stars until they were not only on the, on the side of the moon that was not illuminated by the sun, but also on the part that was not illuminated by the Earth. Um, and when we see that from the Earth, we call it Earthshine. Um, but they really needed to be in complete darkness before they started to see um, the rest of space. And then when that became apparent, it was beautiful. But they didn't see it all the time. Um, I don't know, and Andy may know, I, I don't know whether Apollo 8 saw any of the other planets. I know they saw stars, and they used stars for navigation. Um, but there were many times when they couldn't see them because they were literally in daylight. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, this is uh, one of the things that, um, you know, there is a small minority uh, of people who actually don't believe that the moon landings happened. And one of the things that they always say is, hey, if they, if they are on the moon, how come there are no stars in the photos? Well, the fact is that the stars are, you know, millions of times fainter than the sunlit surface of the moon itself. And so whether you're looking at it with your eyeball or photographing it with a camera, you've got to have the right conditions to see stars in the daylight. And there's only one example that I know of where a planet is recorded in a lunar surface photo. It's a photograph from Apollo 16 and it does show Venus if you know exactly where to look in the photo um, and it's only you know one little bright dot because Venus is extremely bright and you know we can see Venus even here on Earth if you know exactly where to look sometimes you can see Venus in the daytime but in general as Ernie said even if you're standing on the surface of the moon if you want to see stars you'd have to go into the shadow of the lunar module and let your eyes dark adapt before you could really see them. Otherwise, you know, you're really just, everything's washed out by the brightness of the landscape itself. Um, and uh, we're getting questions in Fast and Furious here. Uh, one of the questions that have come in, uh, people are asking, what part of Earth are they looking at? And I actually was tr squinting at the image behind Ernie trying to see what if I could see a continent there. Um, Andrew, what exactly, what part of Earth is seen in Earthrise? And then the follow-up question is people are asking, does it change as the, the capsule spins and as we go, as the moon goes around Earth? Well, well, Ernie really nailed this down, so I'll let him talk about it. Okay. Um, the Earthrise image that was taken um, on the fourth orbit shows uh, the western coast of Africa at the bottom. And north is to the right in that image, and Antarctica is visible on the left side of that image. And South America is coming into view at the top. Um, in later, on later orbits, um, Africa has moved into nighttime, and um, South America is central in those pictures. Um, so yeah, the, the, Earth, the Earth is rotating. It took them about two hours per orbit. So the Earth would rotate one twelfth of the way around in between each orbit, um, and the Moon is also moving a little bit, and that has a has a smaller effect on what part of the Earth is visible. Um, those yeah, those changes are absolutely visible in the photography that they took. Fantastic. Um, one of the questions we're getting that I think someone who speaks for the robots is noting that this was the first Earthrise taken by humans. Now, uh, Andrew, you probably know this uh, as well. What, what was the first Earthrise image then ever taken? I have the answer here because they've been sending it to us. But Right, and uh, I think I maybe know who that person is who's asking that question. Uh, I think I do too. They, they're absolutely right. The first image of an Earthrise was actually taken by a robotic probe called Lunar Orbiter. And I don't remember which lunar orbiter it was. I have a feeling it might have been lunar orbiter 4, but I'm not sure. In 1966, I believe, it was a black and white image. Um, because of the way that lunar, the lunar orbiter probes, not to be confused with today's lunar reconnaissance orbiter, the lunar orbiter probes, which were the first to create detailed photographic maps of the moon, had an unusual image system where they actually shot photographic film on board, developed that film on board, and then scanned the resulting uh, developed film and, re and transmitted that uh, as brightness 
variations uh, to the Earth, and that was then reconstructed into an image. So when you see one of those lunar orbiter images, they're kind of like strips put together. Now, a recent project called the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project has done some beautiful work um, reconstructing those images from the original data tapes, and they're much more, um, they're much nicer uh, presentations of those images than we had at the time. And one of the images that they've recreated is that Earthrise image from Lunar Orbiter. So if you Google L-O-I-R-P for Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project and Earthrise, you will find that recreated image. But the difference was, just to add the historian's perspective here, there's no comparison between a camera that is robotically controlled and a camera held by a human. This is, I'm a big fan of robotic spaceflight. I'm a huge fan of robotic spaceflight. But once the astronauts got to the moon, the fact that she had a human taking that picture who could then come home and talk about what it was like to see that, it just struck a, a chord on a much higher, uh, more intense level for, for the entire world. Fantastic. Um, we're having some questions here as well about what the, the orbiter we have around the moon right now. So I wanted to throw it to John. And behind you on your bookshelf is, I believe, a globe that shows the, the topo map that LRO was able to create of the moon in all those beautiful colors. What was the point of creating a very high resolution topo, uh, topo map of the moon and putting it in those, to our eyes, odd colors instead of the black and white that we're used to seeing? Well, I think uh, the reason for the coloring is it, it makes it uh, to the to a person looking at the, the moon. It's, it you can quickly see where the high points are and where the low points are. Um, you know, one of the reasons the science one of the science reasons for for making these maps, uh, just as an example, um, we, we by by looking carefully uh, from both the high resolution images and the and the and the topography, we're able to, to see features on the moon um, that indicate, for example, that, that the moon, uh, this is one of our science discoveries, that the moon is still in a, in a state where it is still shrinking. Now, of course, it's extremely slowly shrinking, but it shows up tectonically in, in, in wrinkle ridges on the moon, uh, but the geologists, you know, they recognize those from, from comparable features on the Earth and other planets, uh, Mercury, for example. They recognize that. They see we, we've discovered that these ridges are, are globally distributed using these data. And, and so we determined that the, that the moon is still in a state of cooling and, 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 and contracting very slightly. But uh, the reason it's important is that um, then we can go back and say, gee, what was the state of the moon when it was formed? Did it have a fully, um, uh, so, did it have a solid core, or was it in a, in a melted state? And knowing a little bit more about the thermal state of the moon now allows us to uh, constrain those models of the moon when it was in, when it was originally formed. So the topography has has a lot of uh, science drivers for it, but then. You know, as I've said, it's also a map uh, for uh, future explorers. I can see the headlines already. NASA says the moon is shrinking. Yeah. How, when we say it's shrinking, is this, are we talking micrometer, millimeters, yeah, something it's, that only geologists would notice? Or yeah, it's 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 extremely slow, and you know, geologists think in, uh, a short period of time for a geologist is a hundred million years, and so. Uh, in, geolo in geological time scales, it's it's shrinking, and 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 we know that these features are are relatively new, uh, new in ge geological times because we look at, at at the cratering around those features, and if there you know if there were a lot of craters over the features, then we would say, gee, it's old because it's had time for the uh, meteorites to uh, uh, age age it, and then. The fact that these features look fairly fresh tells us that it's that they're relatively new. And new, again, in geological speak, is 100 million years, 300 million years. 
A long time is billions of years. <laughs> Geolo in the geology time is a whole different time scale than what we're used to hearing. Um, speaking of new, those of us here on the East Coast recently saw a uh, rocket launch that carried another moon mission that went up, LADEE. John, can you tell us a little bit about what LADEE is doing in, in its studying the moon? And then I can already hear the question, how are we making sure that LADEE and LRO don't swack into each other up there? Well, um, LADEE is, uh, is a mission to the moon that is designed to uh, look at the exosphere of the, the moon and the dust environment. Um, it is in an orbit that is uh, largely equatorial and uh, we're in a polar orbit. And so our orbit tracks actually do cross. Um, it, so we're going like this and LADEE's going like this and I've found that I can't do both simultaneously. I've tried. But, um, uh, we we actually our orbit tracks do cross uh, 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 all the time, and the closest we've been so far to Laddie is uh, uh, I think uh, ten about around ten kilometers. But um, the fact is, is their orbit where we cross is lower than ours, and so there's really no danger that that we would run into them. Um, you know, even if we tried, it's low probability, but but it's really not possible. Uh, but it's interesting that you know we're we're attempting to work with Laddie and do some some coordinated studies. Laddie, uh, because it's in its equatorial orbit and it's got some very high sensitive instruments that are designed specifically for their mission, which is to look at the, the exosphere. You know the, what's in the atmosphere of the, the moon. Um, you know, it does that very well, and we have uh, specifically the LAMP instrument, the UV spectrometer on on the moon. Um, on LRO, and, and we're able to measure uh, some some of the atmosphere as well, and and because we're in a different orbit, we can kind of correlate what their equatorial measurements with our polar measurements, and try to get a more global picture of, of the transport of these uh, uh, very tenuous species that are um, moving around, you know, in the exosphere. Fantastic. We've only got about three minutes left in this hangout, um, and we're getting a lot of questions, and so I'm going to try to do a bit of summaries for some of them. One of them for, for Ernie. Um, now that this is done, what are you doing next? <laughs> People are asking about. Are you planning on taking <laughs> the Laddie data? Are you planning on taking a vacation? I mean, I know a lot of work went into these six minutes that we released today. I'm going to take a nap um, and enjoy the holidays, but um, as soon as I get back, I'm going to uh, restart with uh, what I've been doing. Um, with LRO. Um, they have uh, data that I can't really talk about yet, but um, we're going to do some cool things with. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the data is coming from LRO all the time, and we have to sort of pick and choose what we, what we uh, tell people about. Um, and there will be something waiting for me the first week of January when I come back. Thank you so much. I have one last question then for Andrew. Um, when it comes to, I mean, you've, you've essentially made the Apollo missions your life's work. What is it about the Apollo missions that, that for you just keeps you enthralled with them and keeps them so interesting? Um, it is such a profound moment in human history, the, the moment when we left our home planet and, and took our first voyages to another world. and. Um, you know, I just find that there's always more to discover about Apollo. Um, looking at the Earthrise photo now, um, I couldn't help but think of the, the quote, the famous line from the great Russian space visionary Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who wrote that uh, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. And I, I have to admit, I, I get kind of emotional looking at that picture and realizing that for all of us that is the cradle and to see it with those eyes and realize we're still in the process of leaving that cradle um, it's taken a little longer than we would have expected 45 years ago but the fact that we can keep revisiting that experience and getting more out of it is just a it's an ongoing joy for me and um, I'm just honored to be part of all this Thank you all so much. Thank you to everyone who's been watching this live, and thank you to everyone who's maybe watching it later as it's archived on YouTube for uh, for all time, hopefully. Joining us has been Andrew Chaikin, space historian and author, John Keller, 
um, the project scientist for LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is orbiting the moon right now, and Ernie Wright, who is one of the science visualizers there. You, we will keep, be fo keep answering your questions uh, throughout the weekend and such. And also, if you go to the at LRO NASA Twitter feed, they have been live tweeting this entire event and will be continuing to to post new things, especially since Christmas Eve coming up is the 45th anniversary of this event. So it was 45 years ago, and it's a big anniversary for not only space missions, but I think for all of us here on Earth as viewed from the moon. I'm Aries Keck here at NASA Goddard. Thank you all so much for listening, and thank you scientists for taking part. Thanks, Aries. Thank you. Thank you.